Lingue originali A lingue originali ci avviamo verso la conclusione della prima stagione. Un ciclo di trasmissioni dedicate alla letteratura inglese, francese e tedesca nella lingua madre degli autori che eh, di puntata e puntata è diventato un momento non solo per leggere ma anche per presentarvi in lingua italiana eh, gli autori e eh, creare dei ponti come chi ci segue sa siamo soliti fare qui a Caffè Italia fra letteratura, cinema, teatro e televisione. Per quanto riguarda eh, l'appuntamento dedicato alla letteratura eh, in lingua inglese siamo partiti proprio dalla tv con i monologhi di Alan Bennett, Talking Heads, ricordate, eh, che sono diventati un caso televisivo alla fine degli anni Ottanta in Inghilterra sugli schermi della BBC. Abbiamo continuato con Katsuo Ishiguro di Remains of the Day, quel che resta del giorno. E adesso se vi dico a room with a view, cosa mi dite? Beh, probabilmente qualcuno dirà e cos'è se invece vi dico camera con vista ecco che eh, sicuramente si accende una lampadina camera con vista è un romanzo scritto da Edward Morgan Foster nato a Londra il primo gennaio del 1879 e venuto a mancare nel 1970, il 7 giugno per la precisione, a Coventry. La sua fama eh, ebbe una crescita davvero esponenziale dopo la sua morte e dai suoi romanzi, da alcuni dei suoi romanzi, sono stati tratti dei film di grande successo come eh, Passaggio in India dell'84, diretto da David Lean, e poi con la regia di quel James Ivory che eh, vi abbiamo già nominato per quanto riguarda eh, la direzione, la regia del film eh, Quel che resta del giorno, Camera con vista dell'86, Maurice dell'87 e Casa Howard del 1992. Ma torniamo indietro. Camera con vista, titolo originale a room with a view e iniziamo ad ascoltarlo in questa puntata di lingue originali dalla voce di Marco Piovazzi The signora had no business to do it said Miss Bartlett no business at all she promised us south rooms with a view close together instead of which here are north rooms Here are north rooms looking into a courtyard and a long way apart. Oh, Lucy. And a cockney besides, said Lucy, who had been further saddened by the signora's unexpected accent. It might be London. She looked at the two rows of English people who were sitting at the table, at the row of white bottles of water and red bottles of wine that ran between the English people at the portraits of the late Queen and the late Poet Laureate that hung behind the English people, heavily framed, at the notice of the English Church, Reverend Cuthbert Eager, M.A. Oxen, that was the only other decoration of the wall. Charlotte, don't you feel too that we might be in London? I can hardly believe that all kinds of other things are just outside. I suppose it is one's being so tired. This meat has surely been used for soup, said Miss Bartlett, laying down her fork. I wanted so to see the Arno. The rooms the Signora promised us in her letter would have looked over the Arno. The Signora had no business to do it at all. Oh, it is a shame. Any nook does for me, Miss Bartlett continued. But it does seem hard that you shouldn't have a view. 
Lucy felt that she had been selfish. Charlotte, you mustn't spoil me. Of course you must look over the Arno too. I meant that. The first vacant room in the front. You must have it, said Miss Bartlett, part of whose travelling expenses were paid by Lucy's mother, a piece of generosity to which she made many a tactful allusion. No, no, you must have it. I insist on it. Your mother would never forgive me, Lucy. She would never forgive me. The ladies' voices grew animated. And if the sad truth be owned, a little peevish. They were tired, and under the guise of unselfishness, they wrangled. Some of their neighbours interchanged glances, and one of them, one of the ill-bred people whom one does meet abroad, leant forward over the table and actually intruded into their argument. He said, I have a view, I have a view. Miss Bartlett was startled. Generally at a pension, people looked them over for a day or two before speaking, and often did not find out that they would do till they had gone. She knew that the intruder was ill-bred even before she glanced at him. He was an old man of heavy build, with a fair shaven face and large eyes. There was something childish in those eyes, though it was not the childishness of senility. What exactly it was, Miss Bartlett did not stop to consider, for her glance passed on to his clothes. These did not attract her. He was probably trying to become acquainted with them before they got into the swim. So she assumed a dazed expression when he spoke to her, and then said, A view, oh, a view, how delightful a view is. This is my son, said the old man. His name's George. He has a view too. Ah, said Miss Bartlett, repressing Lucy, who was about to speak. What I mean, he continued, is that you can have our rooms, and we'll have yours. We'll change. The better class of tourists was shocked at this, and sympathised with the newcomers. Miss Bartlett, in reply, opened her mouth as little as possible and said, Thank you very much indeed. That is out of the question. Why? said the old man, with both fists on the table. Because it is quite out of the question, thank you. You see, we don't like to take, began Lucy. Her cousin again repressed her. But why? he persisted. Women like looking at a view. Men don't and he thumped with his fists like a naughty child, and turned to his son, saying, George, persuade them. It's so obvious they should have the rooms, said the son. There's nothing else to say. He did not look at the ladies as he spoke, but his voice was perplexed and sorrowful. Lucy, too, was perplexed, but she saw that they were in for what is known as quite a scene, and she had an odd feeling that whenever these ill-bred tourists spoke, the context widened and deepened till it dealt not with rooms and views, but with, well, with something quite different whose existence she had not realised before. Now the old man attacked Miss Bartlett almost violently. Why should she not change? What possible objection had she? They could clear out in half an hour. Miss Bartlett, though skilled in the delicacies of conversation, was powerless in the presence of brutality. It was impossible to snub anyone so gross. Her face reddened with displeasure. She looked around as much as to say, Are you all like this? And two little old ladies, who were sitting further up the table, with shawls hanging over the backs of the chairs, looked back, clearly indicating... We are not. We are genteel. Eat your dinner, dear, she said to Lucy, and began to toy again with the meat that she had once censored. Lucy mumbled that those seemed very odd people opposite. Eat your dinner, dear. This pension is a failure. Tomorrow we will make a change. A lingua originali, Marco Piovaz ha letto per voi in lingua inglese. 
Lo ritroveremo su Caffè Italia la prossima settimana, venerdì, sempre alle ore 22. Ma Lingue Originali è in onda anche il sabato con Nadia Meroni, con la lettura in lingua tedesca, e la domenica con Barbara Marchand, per quella in lingua francese. Vi ringraziamo per l'ascolto e vi diamo appuntamento a Lingue Originali fra sette giorni, sempre su Caffè Italia, la radio e il podcast dalla Roma italiano e non solo. Lingue originali